We're going to be looking at uh, 2 Peter chapter 2. I want to ask this. <clears throat> Have you ever been at the wrong place at the wrong time? Yes. Uh, one afternoon several years ago, uh, I had a pickup for sale and it was parked beside the house and I decided I was going to move it out to the road to get more visibility. And So I moved the pickup out in front of the house along the road and that night a windstorm came and blew over a tree right across the hood of the pickup. It was at the wrong place at the wrong time. You think about Noah and the ark. God sent a flood. And we could say that those who are outside the ark when the flood came were at the wrong place at the wrong time. Uh, we think of uh, the day that God rained fire and brimstone on Sodom and Gomorrah and rescued Lot. Those that were still in the city, they died in the fire and brimstone. We could say they were at the wrong place at the wrong time. You know, being in the right place is really important. Uh, a wrongly placed decimal point can change a check supposed to be for a thousand dollars to either ten dollars or a hundred thousand dollars. Whether you're the one writing the check or receiving the check, it make a big difference, right? <laughs> the wrong place. You know, it's not a very big place. Just this way or that way. It's a big deal. Uh, Jesus spoke about being in the wrong place. Uh, it tells us that uh, he noticed how. Guests at a wedding feast were picking out places of honor. And he, and he said to his disciples, he says, when you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, don't play, take the place of honor. For someone more distinguished than you may have been invited by him, and he who invited you both will come and say, Give your place to this man. And in disgrace, you will proceed to occupy the last place. But when you're invited, he said, Go and recline at the last place, so that when the one who has invited you comes, he may say to you, Friend, move up higher. Then you will have honor in the sight of all who are at the table with you. Right, here in Second uh, Peter chapter 2, it talks about angels who are judged by God. In verse 4, and it doesn't tell us specifically what their transgression was, but it probably had something to do with not staying in the right place. Uh, Jude speaks of these uh, angels, probably the same, uh, speaking of the same thing, and it says they did not keep their own domain. God had created them and given them a realm, a domain. Uh, the word is house. and um, It says because they deviated from where God had put them, they were judged by God. They were in the wrong place. Uh, when you think about it, one of the most important things in our lives is for us to be in the right place. Sometimes people will say, I'm not in a good place. And what they mean by that is that they're thinking, they're, then they're where? They're thinking in their attitude and, and where that's leading them is bad and they know that they're not thinking. Maybe some of you find that right now in your own life today, right? At this minute, like, it's like, oh, I'm not in a good place. Or other times people say, I'm in a good place, you know, I'm, I'm at peace, I have contentment, I'm focusing on the Lord, I'm reading the Word, I'm fellowshipping with the Lord, I'm walking faithfully. Place is important. And, and of course, God is the one who tells us what's the right place and the wrong place. And our text today speaks about people who are out of place. And it's not talking about being physically out of place, but positionally in the wrong place with a misplaced attitude, so to speak. 
And so as we've gone through this text, in verse 4 it says, if God did this, and if God did this, in verse 5, and verse 6, and verse 7, if God judged these and protected these, in verse 9, then the Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation. The Lord knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. The Lord knows how to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially certain people. Verse 10, especially those who go after or indulge the flesh and its corrupt desires and those who despise authority. Speaking of the false teachers, he says, daring, self-willed. They do not tremble when they speak against or revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and greater in power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. Uh, This text indicates that false teachers, and there are those today who think it is their place to pronounce judgment and railing and rebuke against angelic majesties. And and this text is talking about false teachers and the certainty of their judgment. Verse 10 identifies these two protruding characteristics of false teachers. They go after the desires of the flesh, speaking mostly of immorality. That characterizes them. And the second thing it says is they despise authorities. And it gives this as an example of how they relate to angels. It's a second characteristic that we want to focus on today and to think about today. And we'll see that it is unbelief that causes us to be in the wrong place. It's failing to know the truth and submit to the truth and believe the truth that puts us out of place. And when we're out of place, then we become the object of God's judgment. Because God is the one who says, stand here. And we say, yeah, I'm going to stand over here. And it's a danger for us. Unbelief causes us to fall into traps, pits of destruction, if you will. And that's where these false teachers lead if we follow them. And so we'll see three dangers in in this text. And the first danger, the first pitfall, is one of attitude. One of attitude. It says at the end of verse 10 that they despise authority. Despise authority. And they being these false teachers. The word despise here, uh, we, we may think uh, when it says despise authority, they hate authority. Uh, but the flavor here is a little bit different than that. When it says they despise authority, it means they look down on authority. Uh, it comes from two words. One word is down, and the other word is to think. Uh, They think down on authority. They despise authority. They see themselves, and instead of seeing authority as those over them, they see themselves on the top of the stack, and all authority they look down on. They despise uh, authority. Uh, They respond to uh, authority in that way. It says that because of this, it goes on to describe what it means to despise authority. It says they are daring. They're daring. They they dare to do something. They're self-willed. The King James uses the word uh, presumptuous. You may have heard it said, never assume. Some of my training and background, there's different situations that you always had to verify everything. You had to check it, you had to double check it, you had to verify it, you had to make sure. Never assume. Because if you assume, then there's a possibility that you're going to assume wrong. And so, 
presumption, being presumptuous, is to make an assumption in advance. And these false teachers, they assume they are the authority. And they assume it before anything else. That is their starting point. And they do it in being self-willed. The Newer International Version says they are bold and arrogant. And arrogant may be expressed as thinking one is so much better than everyone else, always looking down on other people or always saying, I am better. Now, most of us are smart enough to keep our mouth shut and not say that, but we act in ways that demonstrates we are. And so these false teachers despise, they look down on all authority outside of themselves. And so when we think about them, false teachers are those who take the Word of God and says, thus says the Lord, but they despise all authority and they despise the authority of God. They don't respect God. They don't uh, submit to God. They are a God unto themselves. And they don't respect the Word of God. They're, They're not careful to see what the Word of God says. They see the Word of God and uh, supposed worship and following God as a means to an end. And so they bring the Word of God to bear on people's lives and they share the Word of God with people in order to manipulate people, in order to exploit them, in order to take advantage of them, not to communicate the truth. Because they have no respect for the Word of God, the authority of God, nor His Word. They may quote from the Bible... And they may take a verse out of context, they may twist it, and they prey on, on upon the unsuspecting. And so there are people who look to God as an authority. But many people who look to God as an authority are ignorant of what God actually says. And because they're ignorant of what God says, somebody who claims to say this is what God says, they can take it and manipulate it and feed it to people and get people to do what they want and exploit them because people are, if you don't know what the Word of God says. Although false teachers look down on authority, it doesn't change the truth. And the truth is that God is the ultimate authority. Just because somebody denies the truth doesn't change the truth. Just because false teachers deny that God is the authority doesn't change that God is. And that's why it says here that God will judge them. God tells us all that He is a creator. We are His creation. He is righteous and perfect and we are not. And so God as the authority can tell us what's right, what's wrong, how we should respond, how we should relate to one another. We live in a time where many people, even many people who claim to be Christians, dismiss the authority of the Word of God. It dismisses what it says about our relationships with one another and how we should respond and relate to one another. Because it's old, an old dusty book in their opinion. God is the ultimate authority and all authority that exists in the world comes from God. And some of us are willing to recognize God is the authority, but there's no other authority over me. And we're mistaken when we have that attitude and that perspective. In Romans chapter 13, verses 1 and 2, it concisely summarizes it this way. It says, there is no authority except from God. Those authorities which exist are established by God. Therefore, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God, and they who have opposed will receive condemnation on themselves. See, it's a matter of faith. If you're a wife, do you believe your husband is in authority over you and God has given him that authority? If you're an employee, do you believe that your boss has authority over you and God is the one who's given him that authority? If you're a child and a parent is over you in authority, do you recognize and acknowledge that God has given that parent that authority? 
of whatever authority exists is established. Like that's what it says, right? And either we believe it or we don't. And we may be able to reiterate it and state it, but our actions sometimes tell a different story. And see, it's a characteristic of false teachers. And it talks about resisting authority. The word submission is a military term that means to be ordered under. Two words, being under authority and being in order. So the commander says, stand there. Rank, file, your place is there. That's where you stand. He says, turn right, turn left, march, go backwards, turn around. That's what you do. That ordered under. The word resist means to be ordered against. Resist authority. There's an order and we're resisting it. It's Gomer Pyle marching the wrong way in formation. Those of you who remember Gomer Pyle. You know, when we stand in the wrong place, we make ourselves an object of God's judgment. That's what this is saying. These false teachers, they are going to be judged by God because of their attitude towards authority. They despise authority. They look down on authority. They, they fail to recognize that God has established authority and they're unwilling to submit to that authority. And you know, sometimes we're not so different, are we? It's kind of like uh, Wiley Coyote on the old Roadrunner cartoons. So Wiley Coyote, he marks an X on the ground, right? He sets a charge underneath it, or he climbs to the top of a, a cliff, and he waits for the roadrunner to come there, and then it, inevitably something happens, and the coyote ends up on the X, and the anvil lands on his head, or he blows up. And that's how we are. When, when we say, I'm not going to stand there, this is the place I'm going to stand, God isn't going to tell me where to stand, I'm going to stand over here, and we just... We're putting nails in our own coffin. We think there's freedom in rebellion, but the true freedom is in submission. Wiley Coyote is always in the wrong place at the wrong time. And despising authority is like that. When we look down on authority, we're not being very bright. You know, it's one of the things, uh, challenges of uh, growing from a child into adulthood. We pass through this stage till we think our, our, our parents are so dumb and we're so smart. And many of us have been through there. Some of us are still going through there. Right? And, and looking down on authority is just not very bright. It's kind of like, well, it'd be kind of like planning a vacation to Baghdad just before Desert Storm. Uh, not the good place to be. It'd be kind of like planning to hike to the summit of Mount St. Helens on May 18, 1990. Or 1980, rather. The day that 13,000 feet of the mountain was blown into the... You know, when we choose to stand in the wrong place, the place other than where God says it's like doing that. It's like scaling the White House fence dressed in camouflage, popping off rounds from an M16 and, and shouting profanities through a bullhorn. It's just not too bright. It's like getting stopped by a police officer at a traffic stop and when he asks for your registration, you pull out a handgun out of your glove box. Not a good idea. When we look down on authority, we're looking down on God's authority. This should be a little bit sobering for us. It is for me. Because I know at heart I'm rebellious. God places over us authorities and when we step out of the place we should be, it's like, God's crosshairs are on us. And he's a good shot. So we're warned here. 
And what Peter is doing, he's warning uh, believers. He's warning us. Be careful. False teachers, they reject the authority of God and those who follow them are rejecting the authority of God and you don't want to be standing where they're standing. You don't want to be holding hands with a terrorist when their vest goes off. And so we're warned. If you go over to the end of Second Peter, in chapter 3, he kind of summarizes his discussion regarding false teachers and his description. And he says, verse 17, You therefore, beloved, knowing this beforehand. Knowing this beforehand. Knowing what? Knowing that the judgment of God is coming. That's what he talks about in chapter 3. Uh, knowing that the judgment of God will come on those who despise authority. Alright. I know God is coming. The day of the Lord is coming. I know He's going to judge those who despise authority. Knowing that false teachers despise authority. And knowing that falling false teachers puts a bullseye on our back. He says, knowing these things be on your guard. Be on your guard. Watch out. Lest being carried away by the error of unprincipled men. See, it's easy for us to be carried away because we like that. Don't let anybody tell you what to do. You just do what you want. Nobody can tell you you have a free will. Matter of fact, you can even tell God what to do. If He has a promise, you claim that promise. And he has to do it. You ever hear that kind of stuff? If you watch some of these television programs, you will. Uh, it's not a good place to stand. It says, be on your guard. And they're dangerous for us because they say the things, they entice us. You can believe in Jesus and live any way you want. It just doesn't matter. They say those things. God wants your life to be happy. And if you're not happy, you need to fill in the blank. See, they take the truth of Scripture and they twist it. And they make it say what they want. And in making it say what they want, they entice us. And we need to be recognizing that we are susceptible to their enticement because there's part of us that likes that. We want to have somebody tell us it's okay to rebel against the authorities. We want someone to tell us that this, this doesn't, if your husband's not a good husband, you don't have to obey him. You don't have to submit to him. We want to hear that. We want to hear if the government is corrupt, you don't have to pay your taxes. Who? Amen? I, I want that one! But that's not what God says. God says that we are to be in submission to authority whether it's good or bad because all authority is established by Him. You know, there's things in the Bible I don't like. I don't like paying taxes. I don't like it that every dollar that I earn, 50% of it goes to the government. I don't like it. And it's not that I make so much money being self-employed. you got to pay Social Security tax, state income tax, and federal tax. You know, 15, 15, and 10. That's 50, right? But, God says. And so we either submit to God or we resist the authority that God has placed over us. And so it is faith that puts us in the right place. And it's unbelief that elevates us over the authorities that God has placed over us to look down on them. And it's a dangerous place for us. Uh, there's another danger here. And it has to do with fear. Uh, let me ask you this question. Is fear a good or bad thing? Good? What do you think? Fear a good or bad thing? Can be good. Yeah, if we stop and think about it very much, uh, the answer will probably be yes. Fear is can be a good thing and can be a bad thing. You know when we say a child has no fear? That, that child has no fear. 
Uh, that's usually not a good thing, right? They run out into the road, they climb over the fence, they play with electrical wires, uh, they chew on the electrical cord, all those things, right? <laughs> they have no fear. I'm not afraid of electricity, but I'm also quite aware of its power to take my physical life away very rapidly. So I'm cautious and I'm careful. It said regarding these false teachers, they're brash and they lack appropriate fear. In verse 10, it describes them this way, daring self-willed, they do not tremble. They do not, they are not afraid. They are not afraid to go into the ring with angelic majesties that are powerful and more mighty than they. They're not afraid. They do not, but they should be afraid. But they're not. And so this text about angelic majesties raises all sorts of questions in our fleshly curiosity that there's not answers for. We need to be careful that we don't get carried away and, well, who are these and, and how do we relate to them and how great are they? And That's not what it's talking about. The point is really very simple. Here are angels. God created angels. Angels are powerful. Angels are mighty. There's good angels. There's bad angels. Uh, bad angels, maybe demons. I don't know. But what I do know is I don't want to get in the ring with them. And if I face one, that I should be afraid. But they're not. Because they have no respect for any authority. God's or anything God has created. Because they don't believe. Uh, Jude seems to be making reference to the same thing, and he says even Michael the archangel. The archangel has the idea of the first or the greatest. Michael the archangel disputed with Satan over the body of Moses, and that raises lots of other questions, but that's not the point. He says even Michael would not bring a railing accusation against him. And there are people today who are so arrogant that they dare to rebuke Satan. Flippantly. And rebuke angelic majesties as if they had the authority and power to do it. And he says, and they do not tremble because they despise authority. And it's a dangerous, dangerous place to stand. By way of comparison, these false teachers are more arrogant and more brash and more bombastic than some of our political presidential candidates. They're arrogant. They're proud. They're self-centered. They think there is no one with greater authority than them. However, when we know our place because of the truth of God, then we intentionally take our place. There's a very big attitude difference. And so if God says, stand here, we stand there. And if we're not sure where God says stand, then we say, where should I stand? What should I do? Uh, How should I respond? And we bring ourselves into submission to God and we bring ourselves into submission to God's Word. And we got to know what God says. Some of us have not taken the time to study the Bible to know actually what God says. Because we think we know. Or we think somebody's told us. And if we don't know exactly where God, what God says, then how do we know where to stand? And if we're not willing to take the time, just assume that, well, all right, I know. Is that really submission? Or is that presumptuous? Presumptuous. <coughs> if we believe, if we have faith, we act according to the truth of God. We submit to God. We submit to God's Word. We submit to one another. 
You know, the Bible tells us as believers, as followers of Jesus, we have a responsibility to be in mutual submission to one another. It doesn't erase our different roles. Parents and children and husbands and wife and government and so forth, the pastor and, and people in the church and so forth. It doesn't erase that, but we have a, a, a responsibility to be in mutual submission to one another. Uh, we do not presume when we have faith in God to act and function outside of our place. When I, when I go up on the mountain and teach, it's my place to share the Word of God with those that are there that they might know Jesus and, and grow in Him. But it's not my place to go there and establish policy. It's not my place to go there and say, this person should not be here and that person should. It's not my place to go there and say, this is how you should use your money or this is who you should accept. Or it's not my place. Those things are not my place. And I might observe things that perhaps I I observe that are maybe a little bit out of whack, but it's not my place to fix those. It's not my place to correct those. It's my place to faithfully teach the Word of God. And I recognize my place. And I can pretty much assure you that if I went there and started meddling in things that weren't my place, it wouldn't go well. Right? And we could speak about this in many different ways areas and realms in our life. Uh, speaking of the government, Romans 13.3, it says the rulers are not a cause of fear for good behavior, but for evil. Do you want to have no fear of authority? Then do what is right. Stand where you're supposed to stand. Doesn't mean it's a comfortable place to stand. Doesn't even mean it's a pleasant place to stand. Doesn't mean it's a financially profitable place to stand but it's the place where you're told to stand. That's the question. Is God the ultimate authority? Yes. Did God place them in authority over me? Yes. Can I obey them without sinning? Yes. Do I like it? No. Will I do it? Yes. Right? Where there is authority... There is to be respect. There is to be, in a sense, fear. And these false teachers, they do not tremble. They do not have appropriate fear. And God says it's a big mistake for us. No matter how common it is around us, you see this whole idea of rebellion against authority is very prevalent and increasingly common in our culture. Exponentially increasing, perhaps. The idea of we are independent, we are free, we can do whatever we want without any uh, fear of consequences from authority. Well, what he's telling us here is that we can be sure that God is God and God is the source of all authority and if we stand in the wrong place, we're going to fall under God's judgment one way or another. And faith demands that we stand in the place where God has put us. Faith puts us in the right place. And it's a very dangerous thing for us to move from that place. Stay there. Be content there. Rest there. Uh, there's a third danger, third pitfall. And it's, it's really related to the other two. And it's simply failing to recognize that whatever we do, we're doing in God's presence. Look at the, the end of verse 11. So verse 10 says these false teachers are daring, self-willed. They do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties, whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. Before the Lord. Everything we do is before the Lord. You know, if you, you're uh, you're working for someone and uh, the the owner puts his son as a foreman over you, and maybe he's not the best foreman in the world, and now you're in the lunchroom with other employees and you're grumbling and complaining about the foreman, the boss's son. 
And then the boss's son comes in, and maybe if you're really brash, you'll keep grumbling and complaining about him or say something sideways, right? But I'm pretty sure that if the owner comes in, you'll either shut up or you'll lose your job. Right? And we know that. And so typically we want to keep our job and so we put a lid on it. And what he's saying here is that when we rebel against authority, we are doing it before the Lord. God sees. He knows. He will bring every act to judgment. Every thought, every word. There's nothing hidden from his sight. You see, God is there. God knows nothing escapes. He never misses anything. And he never misunderstands. He knows our motives. He knows why, why we say what we do. And false teachers are on a collision course with God and they're traveling at light speed to get there. When a mosquito gets in the way of an intercontinental ballistic missile, the mosquito has a bad day. It's as if... Uh, these false teachers have no idea of who God is and how great He is and how accountable we will be to Him. You've heard it said that uh, you should not come to a gunfight with a knife. These false teachers, uh, they're like uh, coming to a nuclear war with a letter opener. It reminds me of... a. Uh, a scene from one of those uh, crazy Indiana Jones movies. My understanding is it was unscripted. And so this guy comes out and he's going to fight Harrison Ford. And he pulls out this sword and he's doing all of this fancy stuff. Harrison Ford pulls out, boom! It's like... You know, we're kind of like that guy with the sword. When we rebel against authority, the authority God has placed over us. It's, it's inevitable. We're not going to win. God is God. He is the source of all authority. And you see, one of the reasons why false teachers are so appealing to us is because it appeals to our flesh. We want to be self-determining. We want to be independent. We don't like somebody telling us what to do. Whether it's somebody in authority over us in an official capacity or a brother or sister coming alongside us and saying, hey, you know... God says, ah, leave me alone. Who are you? I'm somebody who cares about you. Ah, leave me alone. Right? How do I know this? Because I'm, I'm that way. I'm pretty sure you're that way. And so we're warned here. Be on guard. It's about our faith. Do we really believe that God is the source of all authority? If we do, we will stand in the place of where God says we should, and we know that from His Word. And the problem is false teachers distort and twist His Word, just as the false prophets did in the Old Testament. Arrogance is getting out of place. And we can be thankful that God is merciful, God is good, God is patient with us. And He corrects us, and He says, oh no, this is your place. And we get out of place, and, oh no, this is your place. You know, it's like a little kid. Sit here. Nope, oh, sit here. Nope, oh, sit here. Oh, oh, right? You need octopus arms to keep them in place. And we're sometimes like that in a relationship with God. And yet God still loves us. And it is a wonderful, wonderful thing.